private sorrows and public event blended one into the other. Only on television could we see it whole. They're weird and wonderful, the peculiar plants of wild America. Then meet Anne Bancroft, a woman who likes to go north for the summer, as north as you can go. Mostly what was on these sleds is not so much gear and clothing, but it was dog food and people food. And we'll goof off with the Minnesota Zoo's sea otters. All this and more on Minnesota's own Newton's Apple, followed by the strange cries of the mysterious spirits of the forest on nature. No one brings you family adventure like KTCA. Sunday, all beginning at 7, here on Channel 2. You're watching KTCA-TV, Channel 2. This puzzle has 513 pieces. This identical puzzle also has 513 pieces, but it's incomplete. How many pieces have been put together so far in the unfinished puzzle? That's the question we ask the kids in our studio audience today. The one who made the closest estimate will compete on... Close! Ah! Ah! Yeah, that's right. I'm Reggie Cathy, and this is Close Call. And now, speaking of puzzles, here's the man, Mr. Jigsaw himself, Arthur Zigzag Howard. Thank you, Reggie. Welcome, everybody. Now, let's meet our contestants. And you are? Leonardo. 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 Welcome, Leonardo. Um, how old are you? Twelve. Twelve, exactly twelve? Yeah. Good. And you are? She. Chi. And do you have any hobbies, Chi? What? Yeah. I like to do, um, make math. I like to make little mach um, machinery things. Like oh. Machinery? Yeah. Great. And you are? Amber. Amber. And how old are you? Eleven. Well, welcome. Let's find out who your fourth contestant is. Now, these two puzzles are identical and have 513 pieces each. How many pieces have been put together so far in the unfinished puzzle? That's what we asked our studio audience. Now, the exact number is 160. Now, in our uh, studio audience uh, estimation, there was a tie. Alma Mendoza estimated there were 170. Tanya Marzan estimated there were 150. But both were exactly 10 away from the actual number, right? So then we had to draw their names from a hat. And our fourth contestant is Alma Mendoza. Congratulations. Can I borrow your hat for a second? Good. Okay, now, do you know how to play the game? Yeah. We're going to ask you a question, and then you're going to give us an estimate. You'll have 10 seconds for the estimate. And whoever comes closest wins the first round. Okay, now this is a tape measure measured in meters. It's a metric tape measure, and as you remember, 10 decimeters equals one meter, correct? You following me so far? Because we're going to want a metric answer for this first question. Okay, curtain, please. Ah, you've all met my agent, Karen, here? Okay. Now, here you go, over here. Now, the, do you see that there are two tutus on Karen the elephant? There's one around her leg and one around her waist. Now, the one around her leg measures seven-tenths of a meter. You follow that so far? The one around her leg is seven-tenths of a meter. 
here's the question. How large is the one around her waist? The uh, tutu around her leg measures seven tenths of a meter. What does the tutu around the elephant's waist measure? You have about 10 seconds to give me your estimate. Okay. <laughs> the time is up. Leonardo, may I have your estimate? 35 decimeters. 35 decimeters. Okay. Chi? 14 tenths decimeter. Okay. And Amber? In meters? 49 decimeters. Alma, what is your answer? 13 tenths. Now, the actual answer is... Oh, well, let's find out what the actual answer is, if we can. Karen, would you help us out here? Karen, by the way, is an African elephant. And I don't think she wants to be measured right now. <laughs> <laughs> Who does? Okay. Who does? Throw us that other side, Reg. Come on, oh, come on, Beverly, Atta you do boy. this every day. Okay. What is the actual measurement there? We had just a second. I think she just took a deep breath. Okay. <laughs> you look very good, Karen. Wait a second. Your we color. almost got it so you can see it. Hot pink. Here we go. It is 2.5 meters. There it is. So the closest yeah. is Leonardo with 3.5 meters. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to wheel you over here. Right, but we'll do. Okay, you're going to be one of her finalists. Now, to find out who Leonardo is going to be playing against, we have one more problem for you to figure out. Okay, um, are you ready? Yes. Beverly, would you help us out, please? Sure. Now, let's take these dots off. Okay, can you see that all right over here? Yeah. Oh, you're still moving. Here, now it says close call in candies, as you can say. This is a high caloric question. Now, notice the S in close. There are 54 candies in the S of close call. I want you to estimate how many candies are in the whole close call sign. Let's take a while to figure that out. There's 54 candies just in the S. How many are in the entire close call sign? You at home, try it too. Okay, you have 10 seconds. Well, it sounds like your time is up. Can I have your estimates, Chi? No, oh, well, he's had a second thought there. Okay. <laughs> 480. Okay. Amber? 535. And let's hear it. 300. 300. Okay. Now, the actual answer is 619. So the closest is Amber. Congratulations. <laughs> Before the show, we gave everyone over here a hat. We gave the, some of them a red hat and some a blue hat. Now, what we're going to ask you to do is to estimate what percent of the baseball caps are red. But I just figured out something. I took your cap, so what I'm going to do is give you back yours so the percentage is the same. So it includes um, Alma also. It's everyone in the bleachers and Alma. That's what we're looking for. What percent of the baseball caps are red. First of all, everyone put on your caps. Okay, very good. Now everyone with the blue caps off. Just leave the red caps on. Good. Now blue caps on, red caps off. Okay, good. Now everyone hats waving and say vacation. Vacation! I don't know why that's so, en en so much energy for that. Okay, here's the question. What percent of the baseball caps are red? We're looking for a percent. Okay, what percent of the baseball caps were red, including Alma? Okay, the time is up. Leonardo. 65%. 65%. And Amber? 96%. I can't hear it. What? 96%. 96%. Now, the actual percent is 78%. So it looks like Leonardo is today's champ. Congratulations. <laughs> TV sweatshirts for our champion Leonardo. We have a Square One TV sweater, which is very, very nice. And everyone, this is Arthur Howard for Close Call. See you next time. Bye bye.
your mission is to eat all the hexagons on the board and no other polygons. When you encounter a polygon, you will have until the count of three to make your decision. And beware the senseless Mr. Glitch. He will eat you if you are wrong. Math man, math man, math man, math man, math man. Hi, math man. Six sides, hexagon. Oh, no. Math man, math man, math man, math man, hexagons. Math man, math man, math man. Uh oh. Yeah! Math man, 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 hexagons, hexagons. Math man, math man, math man, math man. Whoa. Worth a try. Oh, drat. I never remember bring me pretty flowers. <laughs> Never dismay. He's seldom flustered. Or rarely afraid. I'll show you numbers that should be displayed. He's a hero and one you friends of the mathematical world, ready for another exciting episode with one of the planet's foremost logicians, are you? Good, because in today's story titled To Heck and Back, Lieutenant Dirk Niblick of the Math Brigade was feeling a little guilty. Not a little guilty, a lot guilty. All Dirk's neighbors were out on a beautiful day mowing their lawn, but Dirk wasn't. Do you know why? I'll tell them why. It's my show. I don't mow my lawn because last year I had the sod taken up and replaced it with artificial grass. So, Dirk doesn't need to mow his grass anymore. That's right, but I realize I actually enjoyed it. Oh, well. Yes, back to the task at hand. Uh, whatever that is. I'll tell you what that is. My bank called me and told me one of my checks bounced. I've gone through all the other checks in my book. 500 of them, and none of them bounce. That probability is mind-boggling. I think the bank may not be playing with a full FDIC. Suddenly, Dirk's doorbell chimed. I've got to get those chimes, too. Well, 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 if it isn't Mr. Beasley, my next-door neighbor. If it isn't Mr. Beasley, your next-door neighbor, these police will really have the wrong guy. How may I serve you? Well, let's see. You could throw me up in the air and hit me with a tennis racket, or you could put a pomegranate in my mouth and bake me in your oven at 350 degrees for four hours, or... Come on, Measley, stop stalling. Oh, I'm sorry, officer. I just stopped by to ask you to pick up my mail while I'm away, Lieutenant Niblick. Oh, of course I will. How long will you be gone? Seven to ten years. What? He robbed a bank and got caught. You robbed a bank? That's what they say. Hard to believe, isn't it? I was always such a shy, self-effacing sort of chap. Well, yes. I'm sort of the last guy you'd think of who'd stick up a bank, huh? But these nice officers said I did it, so I'll be going now. Uh, thank you for watching the mail. Well, sure thing, but... Oh, listen, if you think of it, in a year or two, uh, you might feed the cat. I'd better look into this. And that's what our hero did, by gosh. He went right to City Hall. <laughs> now, 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 sir. I'm afraid you'll have to stop. How's come? You can't fight City Hall. Oh. Dirk decided to talk with the district attorney and find out what happened. Are you the district attorney, mister? Yes, and it shall be my duty not only to prosecute to the limit of the law all persons accused of crimes perpetrated within this county, but to defend with equal vigor. Why have you arrested Mr. Beasley? He robbed a bank in a nearby town. What town? A town called Heck. He went to Heck and robbed the Heck Savings Bank. To Heck, you say? The Heck, I don't. He robbed it at high noon, and we arrested him at home at one o'clock. We know he did it because witnesses described the getaway car as bright red. 
Beasley has a red car. Yes, but lots of people have red cars. Not with a duck-billed platypus on the antenna. Good point. Mind if I talk with Mr. Beasley? Not at all. He's in the third cell on the left. You'll recognize him from the racking sobs. It was nice of you to come, Lieutenant Niblick. Uh, did I get any mail? Well, you've only been here for an hour, Mr. Beasley. The mail hasn't even been delivered. I know you didn't rob that bank, but have you ever been in the town of Heck? Not for a long time. I used to go to the annual Healthy Gums and Frontier Days celebration as a young man. How far away is Heck? It's about 75 miles. Uh-huh. How are the roads to Heck? Oh, a lot of potholes, but they're paved with good intentions. Where were you yesterday at high noon, Mr. Beasley? I went to the movies at 10 a.m. You went to the movies in the morning? Did anybody see you in the theater? I hope not. Then what happened? Well, I got out about 12.30, and the police arrested me when I drove up to my home at about 1 o'clock. How fast does your car go, Mr. Beasley? Well, if I slap the pedal to the metal, I can hit about 50 miles an hour top speed. Mr. Beasley, I may have you out of here before the cock crows. Oh, for joy. But if it doesn't work out, uh, don't forget the mail. Even bring the occupant stuff, okay? Yes, I think I can prove that Mr. Beasley could not have robbed that bank at 12 noon. Well, you miniature detectives, have you spotted something that will prove that Mr. Beasley could not have robbed the Heck Savings Bank? <laughs> I must admit, I can't puzzle it out yet, but I'm going to keep using my old noodle. And after that, I'm going to try to solve the problem. I may even get a new noodle. I'm not sure, but I know this. We'll be back in our jiffy. I've got the 519 blues because of all those numbers that ain't round. I've got the dollar 98 blues for two cents more. How does two bucks sound? My home is 163, not 160. My street is 149, not 150. I wear a seven and a half shoe, and I'm telling you, I was born in 1972. Am I blue? There are lots of numbers you can round off. Like, there are about 20 buildings on this block, even though there are really 22. There are 241,460,718 people in America, but you could round it off and say there are about 240 million. Rounding off makes communication simpler. But don't try rounding off the time the train leaves, or you will miss it. I've got the 519 blue. Well, have you figured out what Lieutenant Dirk Niblick has figured out? I thought I had a minute ago, but it was not to be. Let's see what Dirk's doing. Well, I'll be a son of a gun. Dirk is in court. All right, Mr. Niblick. You've told the court that you have evidence that will prove your neighbor, Mr. Beasley, did not rob the Heck Savings Bank. I object. On what grounds? None in particular, but my wife says I'm very objectionable. You're out of order. No wonder I don't work very well anymore. If it please the court, Your Majesty. Go for it. I would like to call the court's attention to this chart. What about it? Mr. Beasley says he was at the movies from 10 until 12.30. But he has no witnesses. That's right. But his car can go no faster than 50 miles per hour. The bank is 75 miles away. I do get good mileage, though. So, he could have left town at 10.30 a.m., got to heck at noon, robbed the bank, and split. And then what, Mr. District Attorney? Then he was arrested. Yes, he was arrested in this town, one hour after the bank was robbed. He couldn't have gotten back here in one hour because his car only goes 50 miles per hour at top speed. Hey, that's right. I couldn't have robbed the bank. I didn't think I did it because I'm such a shy, self-effacing person. Even if Mr. Beasley was in heck, he could only have gotten within 25 miles of this town by 1 p.m. He is innocent as a newborn babe. Lieutenant Niblick, you make an excellent case. Mr. Beasley, you are released. Thank you. Thank you, one and all, for helping me believe in our wonderful system of justice once again. Suck a swamp through a straw. 
And so, as Lieutenant Dirk Niblick and his steel trap-like mind solve another case, we take solace in the knowledge that there are problem solvers like him around for when guys like us really get into trouble. I'm glad I could help you, Mr. Beasley, and you're doing a fine job mowing your lawn, if I may make so bold. Thank you, Lieutenant, and you're doing a fine job too, sir, whatever you're doing. And so he was, mowing his artificial grass with an artificial lawnmower. Gosh bless us all, Dirk Niblick. Gosh bless us all. The story you are about to see is a fib, but it's short. The names are made up, but the problems are real. It was Tuesday, 2.43 p.m., and whatever was happening in Los Angeles was probably happening on a bed of sprouts, but whatever it was that was happening was happening without us. I was working the day watch out of MathNet, miles away from our home base. The boss is Thad Green. My partner is George. What a dude, frankly. My name is Monday. I'm a mathematician. A young friend named Bronco Guillermo Gomez had gotten us involved in trying to find $90,000 worth of gold, which was stolen in 1853. It was a real mystery, and we decided to look at a few scenes from the previous show to help jumpstart our memories. Someone had been trying to frighten us away from Moat's Gulch, and we finally found out who... Trying to scare us away? Yeah. Hoping we never come back? That about covers her. It almost worked. Scruffy seemed to be a harmless old desert rat who just liked to be alone, but came with us as we tried to locate a landmark on the map Bronco had. We used mathematics to solve the problem. Let's assume that the map is to scale. If one inch stands for five feet, then how far is it from the rock to the arrow and from the tree to the arrow? Eight inches from the rock and 10 inches from the tree. 40 feet and 50 feet. I'll get the ropes. We measured the ropes, 50 feet on one, 40 feet on the other. We walked them out from the tree and the rock using a mathematical method called triangulation. This is where the gold should be. Miss Monday! I hit something! You certainly did. We found the treasure! Yahoo! Ninety thousand dollars! I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own desert rat eyes. Open it up, hard. Treasure? No. The other part of the map. Other part of map. C. Myrer, 1853. Myrer? What does that mean? I don't know. Other part of map. C. Myrer. Probably means in 1853, there was a man named Charlie Myrer who had another part of the map. Charlie Myrer? Or Claudia or Calvin, some first name that begins with C. You may be right, but he'd be dead by now. If we could find out who this person was, maybe we could still find the other part of the map. Maybe it's at a house he owned. Or maybe they buried it with him. It's worth a try, I guess, but sure seems like a long shot. We've got those books from Mr. Mutard. Maybe there's a census in one of them. You know, a, a list of people who lived here. I'll check that, George. I'll check the register of deeds and newspaper files. What can I do? Bronco, why don't you and Scruffy check out Boot Hill? Boot Hill? The cemetery, sure. Maybe there's a tombstone with a name on it. Right. OK. Move them out. Each member of our team had an assignment, and we carried it out quickly. The person named Myra, of course, might not have lived in Mulch Gulch. He might have just been passing through, but it was a clue we had to follow up. George didn't have any luck. Nothing in the books, Kate. There was no census list. They've been taking censuses since 1790, George. Maybe Mr. Mutard has the census list. If we had a phone, I could call him. Their nearest phone is about a five-mile ride, George. I'd do it, George, but I haven't finished my task. Yeah. 
I was having no luck, and neither were Scruffy and Bronco. Nothing, Kate. Not a marker with a name on it that's even close to Myra. We looked at every one, too. I didn't find anything. Maybe George is having more luck. Mr. Mutard, George Frankly, do you have a census for the years? 1850 to 1860 for Mulch Gulch? Most certainly. You do? Is there a name C. Myrer? I'll check. I'll be just a minute. I... Oh, yes, Mr. Mutard. I'm sorry, Mr. Frankly. According to the records, no one by that name lived in Mulch Gulch at that time. Rats. I thought we had the gold for sure this time. Thank you, Mr. Mutard. My pleasure to serve you, Mr. Frankly. It's okay. There's no day we'll fight. We're right back where we started. I ain't. You ain't? I mean, you aren't? Nope, but I'm about to be. I'm going back to my camp. Nice meeting you folks. And next time I'm in L.A., I'll say hello. You come to L.A. occasionally, Scruffy? Nope, never had reason to before. Ciao. We said goodbye to Scruffy and decided to play What If at the local saloon. What's What If? A little game we play to try to get our facts in order. Can help you lay out a problem like this. What if the C. Myra was Capone's partner and he lived in another town? There wouldn't be a record. Uh huh. What if C. Myra was his wife and Myra was her maiden name? But why would Mrs. Capone use her maiden name? Maybe she used it professionally. What if C. Myra isn't a person? What do you mean? I mean, what if the word means something else? Like Myra. Myra doesn't mean anything. Mirror. Doesn't mean anything either. Mirror. See mirror? That's not how you spell mirror. It's not how you spell C. That's gotta be it. Other part of the map, C mirror. Other part of the map, C mirror. Hold it up to the mirror, Kate. The mirror. It's like the ambulance in Monday's show. Yeah, maybe it's backwards and reversed. Nothing. Turn it around. What the... hex? Hex? A hex is a spell of some kind. Something's funny about that word. Yes. The letters are symmetrical, if that's what you mean. Yes, if you put a mirror along one half, you see the other half. That's why they make the word. What I meant was... Maybe he misspelled another word. Hex. Look. Bronco, you've done it again. Hex marks the spot. One hundred percent of Square One TV is a production of the Children's Television Workshop. This program was made possible by grants from the National Science Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the U.S. Department of Education, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. The land of Narnia becomes a battleground as four children join together to combat the forces of evil. And Aslan makes a fateful pact with the White Witch. The dramatic conclusion to The Lion, the Witch, on the next Wonderworks. Saturday night at 7, here on Channel 2. Long ago and far away, heroes and villains, fairies and dragons, love and magic. Stories the whole family can watch.